All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, see, when, when Josh is not teaching and preaching, he just cracks jokes the entire time, so that's fun. All right, quick preview of where we're going. There's a, there's a not as splashy a title as I could have written at the top. Uh, we're, we're really overviewing uh, the meaning behind some of the martial language, some of the military kind of language we see in uh, the New Testament describing the Christian life, the epistles. Uh, that's the focus. I could have titled it spiritual warfare because really that's what we're talking about. That's the purpose behind those words. The Bible kind of casts all of our existence in the context of a cosmic war, right? There's a kingdom that's been torn apart by rebellion, and the rebels are hopelessly outmatched. We're not talking about Star Wars here. We're not cheering for the rebels. Uh, but even though they're outmatched, they continue to rage, and they're intent on dragging as many people with them to defeat as possible. And they oppress those that they cannot drag. And we, as the creation of God, live all of our days in the middle of this cosmic battle that we don't see. In fact, we're actually participants in it, the Bible says, because we chose the wrong side by default. We belong to the rebels. And then God, in his mercy, calls some of the rebels to belong to him. And we switch sides, but we're still combatants, which is why the New Testament is full of this language about warfare and the military and being soldiers and all of that. It's saturated with martial language military imagery, suffering, fighting, enduring. And so we're going to try to trace out that theme across the canon this morning. Try to have a, a biblical theology, very briefly, of what has been called spiritual warfare. So before we talk anything about it, and you have a question on there under the word war, uh, again, I'm not going to ask you for your responses because I want you to write a bunch of stuff that's not theologically correct. So the question is, what comes to mind when you think of spiritual warfare? Why do you think that is? Right. So again, you don't need to write a treatise. I, I want gut level, what's out in the culture, what pops in your mind. Maybe it's the exorcist. Maybe it's the Catholic Church or the Da Vinci Code. Or, or maybe it is. Maybe you have had some uh, teaching specifically about the subject and it's solid. But just kind of empty your brain of all the things that come in when you think about spiritual warfare. And then hopefully we will construct a biblical theology uh, from the ground up. So we'll take about three minutes to do that and then we will continue on. All right. Uh, so hopefully you have uh, some kind of idea about where we're going. Uh, your brain is now thinking in terms of what you may have heard about spiritual warfare, whether it be from the Bible or from popular culture. Just a quick overview, some basics uh, before we dive in. I'm going to cover all of this again. But really, the, the battle is pitched between two opposing sides. You've got God and those who are on his side, and you've got Satan and those who are on his side. So up to this point, popular culture kind of gets it right. Uh, the odds, though, are where popular culture diverges a little bit. Here are the odds if you're betting in Vegas. God's side has 100% chance of victory because 100% of the victory is already won. Satan's side has 0% chance of the victory because 100% of the loss has already been taken. Uh, so the losing side actually is constantly, ever, and only under the sovereign control of God. Here's, here's why this matters. It matters because of what we see around us, right? Most of this is invisible. We don't see it happening. And so it can be a very disorienting thing to live the Christian life in light of what we see around us. We don't see everything in subjection to Jesus yet. We don't see all of his enemies put to flight. It can be easy to forget that the odds are what they are. It can also be difficult to remember this in light of what we see in us, right? Our own sin. We don't even see our own hearts fully and completely freed from the presence of sin. We've talked about this the last couple of weeks. It can be difficult in light of the, the sort of prevailing views in our culture about the unseen realm. One of the main ones is, is what can be called dualism. So the idea that God and Satan are sort of in this grand tug of war match, and it's kind of, you know, six to one and pick them as to which side is going to come out on top. That is not the biblical picture of what is happening. There is no like, well, we'll see. I don't know. Satan's a tough opponent. Like that's, that's not what the Bible presents at all. Or sometimes you hear that you know, God is in charge of heaven and Satan is in charge of hell. That's also incorrect. 
So let me tell you what we're not going to cover, uh, just so that you can go ahead and flip to the end of the handout so that you can look at some of the suggested resources. We're not going to do a comprehensive demonology here. So we're not going to talk about, you know, whether or not you can be possessed and how demons work and all those things. Now, we're not going to answer some of the hot button questions that come up, like are there generational curses or how should we think about deliverance ministries or how should we think about the occult and demon possession? And it's not because those things aren't important, right? I want to be clear. Those are good questions. It's just because we don't have time. There's a lot to cover. So let me point you to one really good resource that I've been blessed by this week. Many of you uh, have heard of David Platt and Secret Church several years ago. There's a whole like six and a half hour, it's billed as six and a half hours, actually like nine, uh, our Secret Church on the issue of spiritual warfare. In fact, if you go through that, you'll notice I, I borrowed a lot from David Platt in constructing this lecture because it's a phenomenal, comprehensive biblical theology on the subject. And at the end of it, there are uh, probably about 10 pages of frequently asked questions, right? All the stuff that like we see in Hollywood, there are answers for. How do we think about the occult? Can Christians be possessed? Can other people be possessed? Should we be casting out demons? All of those are in there. So if you have those questions, I'd encourage you to go to Radical.net and check that out. But I want us to restrict our focus for our few minutes ahead of us to specifically, how do we see this theme of warfare unfolding across the pages of Scripture? How do we see it described in the Old Testament? What did Christ accomplish? And then how does that affect what we see described in the New Testament? So that's the goal. We're going to start in the Old Testament. And here's a great uh, little summary couple of verses from Deuteronomy. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. This is describing the worldview and situation surrounding Israel throughout the Old Testament. So the Canaanite, the Egyptian, and the Babylonian context are all dominated by an occultic worldview and practices. So possession and exorcism were prevalent. Things were explained by these cultures in terms of demons being at work. There's demonic agents, there are demonic activities, and that's perceived as normal. And behind these idolatrous Uh, entities are demons. So this is the culture that saturates the Old Testament that Israel finds themselves in. And the result of it is twofold. Number one, and this is your first blank, moral degradation. So we see the result of this sort of demonic, um, idolatrous culture is moral degradation, cult prostitution. Uh, you, You have children being sacrificed to idols. The point is clear that decline morally always follows idol worship. And the second one you see is physical devastation. Physical devastation. So these demons behind these idols are not just content with moral degradation. They're also intent on physical destruction. Again, children being sacrificed to idols. You can think about the prophets of Baal or Baal, as it's actually properly pronounced, but we say Baal because that's what we usually say. right? So Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they're, they're slicing themselves open in propitiation and entreaty to this God. right? So Moral degradation, physical devastation, those are the two consequences. They're also the two main weapons of those who are allied against God, whether that's Satan or sin. Those are the two things that the opponents of God are always after, moral degradation, physical suffering. Let's quick look at a couple of passages here from the Old Testament. Genesis 3, 1 through 15. I'm not going to read all these. We don't have time for that, but I'll, I'll summarize. Genesis 3 is the fall, right? Uh, and so we see in this a, a very clear picture of the nature of our adversary, that God is the creator and Satan is a creature, right? That's the blank. Satan is a creature. It's very important. Satan is not a competing deity. He is a created being. We also see in Genesis 3, 1 through 15, that God is sovereign and Satan is subordinate. God doesn't go, oh, Satan, you won this one. I'll get you next time. No, he, he curses the serpent, right? So you see a couple of characteristics of Satan. And again, I'm summarizing. If you read Genesis 3, 1 through 15, you'll see this. Satan can speak. He is smart. He maligns God's character. That is actually what he does in temptation. He questions God's word, and he is a malicious liar and murderer. Satan didn't kill anybody in Genesis 3, you might say. What is the result of sin? It's death, 
right? So he is a liar and a murderer. You also see the nature in this passage of our warfare. The, the real questions that characterize our existence are, are these. Who will rule our hearts? Whose voice will we listen to? Who will we trust and obey? Those are called into question at the very beginning of the Bible, right? You also see the consequences of our defeat, both Adam and Eve and yours and mine, because we follow after Adam and Eve, right? We see that the result of sin is, is suffering in this life. The penalty of sin is eternal death. And those, and I'm, this is plat here, those who listen to the serpent's voice will feel the serpent's fangs. There isn't a Christian alive who cannot attest that this is true. We see this not just with Satan, but really with all spiritual beings who are allied against the Lord. So this is true of demons as well, those who serve under Satan. First Samuel 16, 13 through 23. This is an odd passage where it says that the Lord sent an evil spirit to torment Saul. But clearly what we see here is the judgment of God on Saul and his exalting of David. And if you read this passage, there's two important principles about spiritual warfare in the Old Testament you'll see. Number one, uh, the powers of evil are inferior to God. So it's not that this, this evil spirit just sort of takes over Saul. No, God sends the evil spirit to torment Saul. They are inferior to God. And the second one is, it's not out of nowhere. Right? The, the spirit who's tormenting Saul is actually a consequence of his own sin. Right? It's not like Saul is like serving the Lord and sacrificing, and then bam, he's tormented by this evil spirit. He's, he's actually rebelling against the Lord, and as a result of his judgment, sort of in a Romans 1 kind of way, the Lord gives him over to the powers that he is serving. And we see this played out all over Saul's life. You can look at 1 Chronicles 10, 13 through 14. I'll read it very briefly. It says, So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Notice in those words, right? What we don't see is, man, Saul's just this really solid king who wants to serve the Lord, and then, man, just evil powers overtake him. No, Saul is a sinner who rebels against the Lord, and as a result of that, he experiences what he experiences from evil under the authority of God. So what we see is that God's wrath, that's your next blank, is against human rebellion. That is sort of the the governing principle. That God's wrath, his anger, is against human rebellion. That's the the main operating principle in our lives. It's not like the devil made us do it and now God's mad. No, we have rebelled and we experience God's wrath. And the moral evil and physical devastation that's brought about by evil beings is a part of that principle. You get another picture in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Many of you are familiar with this story, so I won't summarize it. But in thinking about this narrative of Job, if you haven't read this, you should go read it. We learn a couple of things. The primary truth in this story is God's sovereignty, right? That's the primary point that Job's life and what we see going on behind the scenes is making. That God is sovereign. Satan only speaks when God speaks to him. Satan only acts within God's permission. And Satan only acts to fulfill God's purpose. Again, it's not like Satan is off the leash. He is very much on the leash the primary victory is not even Job, you know, coming up with this great, like, exorcistic kind of thing. No, it's just Job's morality. He glorifies God by believing him and submitting to him. He humiliates Satan by refusing to give himself over to sin. He doesn't obey the words of his wife, just curse God and die. He's not perfect in the narrative, but also the main victory is his morality. He glorifies God. In those ways. Zechariah chapter 3, you see Joshua is a vision. Joshua is standing before the Lord in filthy clothes. Satan is standing next to the Lord, pointing the finger at Joshua's filthy clothes, accusing him. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture and promise of redemption. You see a couple of things. Satan is limited. right? God actually cuts him off from speaking. And Joshua's main problem is not Satan. It's his sin. Sin is the problem. That's the blank. Sin is is the primary problem. That's what has made Joshua's clothes filthy. He's given new clothes, and we see that a Savior is coming. A Savior is coming. 
So, so to try to summarize, and these are just a couple of examples, but let's try to put this in principle form. Uh, some observations and conclusions about the whole Old Testament text. Here, here are a few. Number one, the Old Testament minimizes Satan and demons. I hope you, you can see how it minimizes this uh, for, just from the, the couple of examples we've looked at. What, what I don't mean by minimize is like they're not there. No, no they are. They're at work. But it minimizes their importance. They are not the main characters. They're not the main problem. So the Old Testament minimizes Satan and demons. Doesn't it endorse the the worldview that surrounds Israel? They're not the main problem. What is? Well, that's the next blank on page three. The Old Testament maximizes human responsibility. So to put it very clearly, the problem is not inhabiting demons. The problem is the human heart. That's the point the Old Testament is making, right? Again and again, we see Israel failing and falling into sin. And as a result of that, they experience oppression, right? So this is, this is really important for us to understand. It's not a dualistic thing. We can't blame it all on Satan. The main problem in the Old Testament is the human heart. You can see this in Genesis 6-5, Ecclesiastes 9-3. Let's just read these. The Lord saw how great Satan's activities on the earth had become. No, that's not what it says. So the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Where is Satan in that verse? It's nowhere. Ecclesiastes 9.3. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure at least for the time being. Who can understand it? Actually, it's probably true across the canon because what are we told? We're given a new heart, right? So this is what the Old Testament teaches, that God is sovereign over Satan. That's your next blank. God is sovereign over Satan. We see this again and again. When Satan shows up, he's not running amok. He is under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. So he possesses unlimited malice. That's important. He has unlimited malice. But he also possesses limited power. That's good news for us. And we see this in the Old Testament. His power is not unlimited. right? He's not fighting against God as if they are equal forces. No, he is limited to only what God allows him to do. Again, sin is the primary human problem. Sin is the primary human problem. We are responsible for our sin. And the main I guess, rock in the shoe that the Old Testament is trying to place. It's more severe than a rock in your shoe. But the main point of discomfort that the Old Testament is pressing home to you and me is not how do we get out from under demonic oppression. It's what do we do with our sin? Because we're responsible for it. We're actually responsible for responding to God in light of it. So either we repent of our sin or we die in our sin. And the Old Testament is full of people not repenting of their sin and dying as a result of it. Like, the earth doesn't open up and just swallow a bunch of innocent people in the Old Testament. It never happens. They're not like wandering in the desert, and then all of a sudden, crevasse, and 20,000 people die. Those kinds of events only come about because of sin, right? So this is what the Old Testament is trying to get across. If you had to sum it up in one big sentence, it's this. Spiritual warfare is God-centered, not demon-centered. What I mean by that is that when we talk about warfare, we are primarily concerned about what God is doing and requiring, not what Satan and the demons are doing to us. God is the one who is to be feared, and he's also the one that we must be delivered from, right? And this is really, really important. God is the one whose wrath we have to escape. That spiritual warfare is God-centered. Satan is secondary. He's not non-existent. He is not the main focus of spiritual warfare. I hope that lays some some clear groundwork for what we're going to see in the New Testament. It's important that we have the corrective lenses of what the Old Testament teaches, lest we fall into the trap of thinking that our main problem is sort of oppression from outside and not destruction from within. That's the the picture the Old Testament paints. So here is uh, just uh, food for thought, kind of get yourself thinking about how do we begin to respond to these truths. We see that Satan is clearly at work, and he's also clearly not our biggest problem. 
So think about a friend of yours, and you may have even had this conversation. Um, maybe if you have a, maybe a Pentecostal friend. Um, I, I had, had a good friend of mine recently that was talking about just some of the differences. They had joined a Baptist church, and they are talking about some of the differences in, in the way that church talked about Satan and demons. And they said, coming from their context, and again, maybe it was only their particular church, but there was a lot that was described as sort of Satan's agency that we were fighting against, taking things back that the devil had stolen from us, and so on and so forth. And they said that 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 didn't really seem to match up with what they were seeing in their Bible. So imagine you have a friend like that um, who only blames Satan and demons for the sin in their lives, right? And it's the title of the question, the devil made me do it. But that is their excuse, right? Maybe it's you, has been me at times. So how, how do you respond lovingly, hopefully, patiently, hopefully? But how do you respond and kind of correct that view? Is there saying, man, I don't shit. I don't know why I got arrested for flipping off that cop in traffic. It just, I don't know, Satan was, was in me that day. I don't know, right? How do, you, how do you respond and maybe lovingly push them towards a more biblical view of what's going on in their life? Just write down a few thoughts, and we'll try to summarize that. I, I will ask if you're willing to share that in just a moment. We'll talk about it. Um, but take a few minutes and just think about that. All right, so what you just witnessed was me having a partial heart attack up here as I found that uh, my iPad had deleted the second half of my notes just to show you the kind of wisdom that exists in our elders. Josh always prints off a a paper manuscript copy of his notes, uh, and I think I probably need to start doing that. But thank goodness uh, for good technology and uh, versions of things you have worked on in the past, I was able to restore it. So you don't have to listen to me bobble around. I actually do have notes. Uh, But let's share a little bit, if you're willing, about how you might respond to that friend of yours uh, who uh, thinks that the devil basically is responsible for all of their sin all of the time. Anybody have any, any places they would go immediately or things that they would think of? Sam? That is a classic Sam Cool response for those of you who may not know Sam. That's great. So Sam said he would start with a question. How much effort did you make to resist the devil? I'm assuming based on some passages in the New Testament that talk about resist the devil and he will flee. That's, that's a great place to start just generally in dealing with people. That's also a wonderfully non-combative way to confront someone. We see God do this with Jonah in the, New Te- or in the Old Testament, right? Jonah's like ticked off and angry and the Lord just asks, do you do well to be angry, right? So how much effort did you make to resist the devil? It's a great place to start. What else? Yeah, Becky. It's almost like you guys are married. That, that is great. So for those of you watching online, Becky said that she, she would also ask a question, but she would ask really about their thoughts. What, what are they thinking about as they're experiencing this anger, to use the, the traffic analogy, right? Our thoughts, we all experience anger. That's a powerful emotion. But what are we thinking about as we seek to fight that? That's a great point. So our CG leaders are fixing to start going through this book uh, called Side by Side, but I would encourage any of you who are interested to, to read it. It's by Ed Welch, who's a counselor. Really easy read, but he just talks about what walking with people through difficult things in life, sin issues, things like that. And that's the first place he goes. He says, your emotions are sort of the starting point on a roadmap. You need to ask questions about your emotions. Why are you experiencing the emotions you are? And that's a great way to trace it back to sin issues that are going on in your heart, which is exactly what Becky's saying. So we could ask, hey, so what, what are you thinking about as you're boiling over with anger? Why, why is it that you are experiencing this? So ask some questions about the emotions there. That's great. What else might you ask or say? Yes, Darren. Yep. Yep. That, that's a really good point. So this is one of the things we're going to see in the New Testament. We, we are not pictured as defenseless. That's the point that Darren's making. Like, God is the one who is sovereign. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church, which is his people. And so 
uh, if they have this mindset that, man, well, Satan can do whatever he wants to me and I'm just totally helpless, that is not a biblical picture of who we are in Christ. And we'll get into that. So that's a great point. You can turn them, not only asking questions about why they're experiencing what they're experiencing, get them thinking about that, but then turning their eyes towards who they are and the resources that they have in Christ, because if they belong to God, those are limitless. And we're going to see that. That's great, Darren. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody have anything different other than those things? I think that's a really solid approach. Maybe take one more. Cindy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Flesh are at wars with the desires of the spirit. Yeah. 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 That is brilliant and, and a wonderful way to kind of wrap all this up. So the New Testament approach to spiritual warfare really focuses on the passions of our flesh. We're going to see the, the couple of things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, but Galatians speaks very clearly to this. You could also go to James, right? Why are there fights and quarrels among you? Is it not your passions that are at war within you, right? And so our passions lead us to sin, which gives birth to death. And so just reorienting their eyes to the New Testament truth and the Old Testament truth, that, that our main problem is what comes from within us, not what is attacking us from without. That doesn't mean that there isn't warfare that happens from without. I want to be clear about that. But primarily, right, this person, our friend, uh, is, is misled about where the biggest threat is from. And so I think that's a great way. You can take them to, to Galatians. You can take them to Romans. Uh, you can take them to James, a million different places in the New Testament. But that, that's the thing we want to see from the Old Testament specifically, that that is the source of our biggest problem, no matter what the sin issue is. So now, because I have all of my notes in front of me, uh, we're going to dive into the New Testament. And I, before we do, uh, lest you think me a gospel-hating heretic, I want to say something that is not on your handout. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplishes fully and for all time the ultimate victory over death, hell, and the grave for all who believe in Jesus, right? That is the statement that preclude or precedes everything else that comes after this, right? But we have covered this ground several times in this course, and so I don't want you to think I'm assuming the gospel. I am assuming the gospel, though. Uh, I just want to make sure we state that very clearly because we're going to dive in now to post christ Because of what he has done, what flows out of that in the Christian life in the New Testament, right? But none of this is possible apart from Jesus and what he has done. Everybody give me a thumbs up if you understand that. You're good with that. Sweet. And also, you don't have any rocks in your hands. That's good. All right, so let's dive in. So fighting from victory. That's that's the main idea in the New Testament. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from it, the victory that Christ has accomplished. So what weapons has he given us for the battle? Well, the battle takes place on three different fronts. The first is the world, right? So the world is around us. It's the unhealthy social environment in which we live. You can see this. It is under the influence of the devil, we are told. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, but understand this in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. I am really glad we don't live in those times, aren't you? And we do, right? And this is... Absolutely, a source of evil and temptation that we experience in our life. This is the world. The New Testament is clear about that. But it's not just the world. It's also the flesh. That's the second blank, the flesh, which is within us. It's our inner propensity to do evil, sometimes called our sinful nature. So to go back to Galatians, where we just were, in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. You were running well, Paul says. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. 
He goes on to talk about leaven, leavening the whole lump. And then he says this in verse 16. It's what Cindy was pointing to just a moment ago. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the world. I recognize I'm reading this, and you probably aren't there. That's not what he says. He says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And he unpacks what it means to not be under the law and being able to serve the Spirit. So the flesh is one of the fronts that this warfare rages on. Finally, maybe least importantly, though it's not unimportant, the devil. So Satan is against us. The evil spiritual being and his demons are intent on perpetrating evil in our lives. Ooh, I should have written this down. I think I did last week. The Screw Tape Letters would be a wonderful book for you to read. Uh, it's companion volume from the Puritans. Uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices is in there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about both of those, but you can think of the Screw Tape Letters as like the reader's edition to Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. Screw Tape Letters is like the movie, but it's a really good movie, so you should read it. So the Bible does not differentiate. I'm sorry, the Bible differentiates these three strands of evil without dividing them. So we can see the world, we can see the flesh, and we can see the devil. Those are three separate things, but they're all operating simultaneously and concurrently in our lives, right? So we, theologically, we can kind of separate them out, but like a, like a big car wreck, there's a lot going on all at one time. So it's not like, well, this thing happened because of the world, but then this thing happened because of the flesh, and then that thing happened because of the devil, right? That's not what actually happens in our experience. All of those three fronts are operating simultaneously. Uh, so they're operating concurrently. We see this in Ephesians 2. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That would seem to point to your flesh. Following the course of this world... Well, that's the world. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that would be the devil, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Again, we're back to the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Do you see how that, that works? It's not one of these at a time. It's, it's all three simultaneously. So, to fight conformity with the world and friendship with the world means we are fighting Satan. To fight the... Dark lies and the lust of the flesh is to fight Satan. This is all bundled together, right? When we wage war on one front, we wage war on all three fronts. I love the way that David Platt puts it. Memorably, he says, the flesh is the hook. So we always have within us, this is your next play, the flesh is the hook. We, we always have sinful desires in us, waiting to take us captive, waiting to erupt. And the world is the bait, right? So the world is always providing us opportunities to gratify the desires of the flesh, to fulfill our sinful desire. And Satan is always baiting the hook. If you think about our friend for a moment in traffic and their anger. Anger is a serious sin and emotion that exists within all of us. Our flesh are, is prone to become angry. And what happens? Our world provides us plenty of opportunities for anger. And... Also, one of the chief tactics of Satan is to place us in situations where we will see the bait and bite the hook. This is what happens as we sin. What this means is that spiritual warfare is a lifelong struggle. It's not a one-time fix. I think this is where some of our brothers and sisters, maybe from other denominations, may, may miss it a little bit. That we, as Christians, those who are justified, who will one day be glorified, are being sanctified, we have to wage war. It's, it's not something that was only done at the cross, and then now we just sort of are adopted into perfection all the way to glory. And we are adopted, our eternal standing is sure, and we wage war now. It's a lifelong struggle. And, good news, we are not left sort of like uh, helpless children to wonder about sort of being preyed on by all three of these things. We're actually given weapons for the battle. So uh, this is the armor of God. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our time trying to unpack this. Hopefully some of you may have memorized this, made some like paper armor in Sunday school uh, to sort of symbolize this. All of those are great things. We want to spend just a few moments meditating on each element of this uh, 
Platt has said this armor is a reflection of the character of God. I think that's really, really helpful. <laughs> it's not your character superpowered, right? It is a reflection of God's character, and it's an expression of the power of God. So again, when we talk about the armor of God, we're not talking about picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. We don't have shoes on. What we're talking about is appropriating the character of God and the power of God in our lives. The Lord desires us to do this. That's why he puts this in the Bible. So when you think about the armor of God, we typically think about Ephesians, right? And raise your hand if that's the book that you think about when we think, yeah, that's where we find this passage. But I think it's fascinating that Paul's source material for talking about this, it's in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Isaiah. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Isaiah 59, he put on righteousness as his breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring the good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, our God, your God reigns. Isaiah 49, 2. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. That's, that's in Paul's mind as he's writing these words in Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. We've been reading 1 Samuel, by the way, if you uh, are reading through the Bible with us in our Bible reading plan as a church. And um, you get this wonderful narrative of David and Goliath. And one, one of the interesting things that happens at the beginning, it's sinful, but Saul tries to send David out in his own armor, and it's super insufficient. So David has to clothe himself in something else. This is what the Lord gives us to clothe ourselves. It's not earthly. It's not something that we find apart from the Lord, but it is the armor of the king of the universe. That's why it's called the armor of the Lord and not the armor of Kurt. So what is it? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So, very quickly, uh, well, maybe not very quickly, but somewhat briskly, a nice walking pace. Let's walk through each of these elements. We'll do hand motions. I'm just kidding. I just want to make sure you're awake. Some of you, head popped up. What's going on? So the belt of truth is where Paul starts off. So what is the belt of truth? Well, it's a true understanding of who Christ is and what he has done, right? That he is fully man. So he's able to sympathize and understand our circumstances, right? We know that. But he's also fully God, so he's able and mighty to act. This is true. That Jesus is all superior, all satisfying, all sufficient. He is all we need to wage this war warfare. He's victorious. He reigns. He's the one with all authority. These are true things that we must fasten around ourselves, coupled with a right understanding of doctrine, what the Bible says. You'll see, like, if, again, if you read uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices or John Owens on the Mortification of Sin and Believers, you will see that Satan is an artful liar. We see this in Genesis 3. Like his lies, they, they sound good. He's not saying, hey, leaving your family and abandoning them for what your flesh wants to do is a, is a great thing. No, it's much more subtle than that's why we need the belt of truth, right understanding of doctrine, what the Bible says, and a right understanding of who we are, that we are the body and the bride and the building of Christ. We bear the authority of Christ. He has actually given us that, that we can flee temptation. We can resist the devil and he will flee. These things will help us fight the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. He doesn't stop there, though. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, this is not self-righteousness. This is not our awesomeness and ability. But rather, 
put on a conscious awareness of, of really two things. So not self-righteousness, but a conscious awareness of our positional righteousness. Again, there are a lot of syllables in those words, and it's early and it's raining. I know we've covered this ground, but when we say positional righteousness, what we mean is legally who you are before God. That he has, he has granted you right standing, that you are justified that you are no longer accounted a sinner and a rebel, but you actually belong to God himself. You've been reconciled to him. He's made known to you the riches of the gospel. He is empowering you to live as if you belong to the king of the universe. And he is well pleased with you. On your worst day, he is well pleased with you because of Jesus. That's positional righteousness. But then also practical righteousness. It's not like we go, well, thank you, Lord, that I am justified. I'm going to blow it all the way to the end, but I'm going to make it. That is not the attitude of a Christian. We have positional righteousness, yes, but we also have practical righteousness. The ability, the actual experience of putting off the old and putting on the new. The ability to see real change in our lives. Difficult, incremental, lots of failing upwards, but actual change. This is a part of the breastplate of righteousness, being conformed in the image of Christ. If you want an elaboration on that, I've got about an hour and 15 minutes of that last week when we talked about transformation. This is sanctification. And he says, feet prepared with the gospel of peace. So in addition to our defenses, we need a good offense, right? That's what I keep telling the Braves. That's why they keep winning. But proclaiming the gospel is one of the best ways to know and experience its power. Right? Proclaiming the gospel. That's why there's this forward-looking feet that are equipped with the gospel of peace. They're prepared with the gospel of peace. I think about deacons when I think about this, and that may seem a bit odd, but in 1 Timothy 3.13, we read this. Those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. And I think it's interesting. Philip is one of the first deacons. He's one of the ones that are appointed in the book of Acts. And what do we see Philip doing? He's actually known, becomes known as Philip the... Does anybody know? Want to fill in the blank? We talked about this week. Philip the evangelist, right? Philip's main role, in addition to doing all the other things the deacons do and serving the practical needs of the church, is he is constantly sharing the gospel. And I think this is true of all the men who are appointed as deacons. And I think that's why Paul says... Those who serve well, not only do they gain a good standing, but they gain great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is what happens when our feet are prepared with the gospel of peace. We proclaim the gospel. Not only do we see sinners come to believe it, but we gain the ability to believe it more and more, to have it actually affect our lives and our emotions and our confidence. We saw this in Romans 10. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they... To believe in him whom they have never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I love what a college student once said. I never learned their name. I heard another preacher say this in a sermon, so I'm going to give it to you. He said, uh, I thought when I heard this, man, that's good. I'm going to use it. And so I did. Because of the Great Commission, I never wake up bored. Right? This is part of the good offense. Proclaiming the gospel is the best way to know its power. In those moments when we're tempted not to believe it, man, looking back on the things that we've seen the Lord do, feet prepared with the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. This is faith in God's character. Right? That's the next blank. Faith in God's character. So Psalm 84, 11, the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk up lightly, up, up lightly, uprightly. We are never more tempted to disbelieve that than when sin is in front of us, right? That's the lie of the devil, that he does withhold good things. That's what happens in Genesis 3, right? I mean, that's the temptation that Satan's putting in front of Eve. Are you sure God is good to not allow you to do that? Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, this is the character of God, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's God's character. He is not withholding anything from you. He graciously desires to give you everything that is good. This is a part of the shield of faith. We believe that. We hang on to it. Faith in God's character 
and also faith in God's promises. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? This is what we're called to believe. That ultimately there is a way out of temptation. This is what God has promised to provide for us. This is a part of the shield of faith. There's more that we could say. We'll leave it there and move on. The helmet of salvation. This is a big one. That's why it goes on your head. Victory in spiritual warfare is grounded in a holistic, starts with an H, not a W, holistic understanding of salvation. Another way of saying comprehensive. And I didn't put it in your notes. But there's a professor at Auburn who would walk in some days, Wheeler Foshi, and say, pop quiz man is here. Did you ever take that class with them? Oh, man, it was great. I, I took Jen to that class. I was a history major at Auburn. I took an elective on vegetable production because one of the dear members of the church that we belong to uh, was a professor there, uh, and he was a wild man. His name was Dr. Wheeler Foshi. He's one of my favorite people. Uh, so I actually took Jen one day, and pop, pop quiz man showed up. Uh, and so Jen took a pop quiz on horticulture for a class that she was not in. So Dr. Foshi, if you ever watch this, that's why you had an extra paper that day. But pop quiz time. The three phases, the three elements of salvation, we've talked about them in the last two weeks. When we talk about a holistic view of salvation, we're really talking about three things. The first would be justification, right? That we have been made right with God. We have been saved once and for all justified. Second, sanctification. So not only have we been justified, but we are being made into the image of Christ. And then finally, third, glorification. You may want to write those down if you have not uh, been thinking about them all week. But this is what we mean by the helmet of salvation, keeping those things in mind. I think about the last two verses in Jude, probably my favorite verses in all the Bible. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority for all time and now and forevermore. Here's why that matters to me. Because in the midst of my sin, I am reminded that one day the Lord will not be ashamed of me. And in the midst of what I see going on around me and the fears that I have for my world and my children and my family and my church, I am reminded of the promises of God that he will finish what he has started that he has justified us, he will make us like Christ. And one day, he will not be ashamed of us. I really struggle to see how that can be. But the Bible says it. It's true. So when we talk about a holistic understanding of salvation, we're really talking about what the Heidelberg Catechism says here, question number 60. I know, near and dear to all of our hearts, but it's a great document. It says, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. In spite of the fact that my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have not kept any one of them and that I am still ever prone to all that is evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of my own, out of pure grace, grants me, it's justification, the benefits of the perfect sacrifice of Christ, imputing to me his righteousness, justification, and holiness, as if I had never committed a single sin or had ever been sinful, having fulfilled myself all of the obedience which Christ has carried out for me, if only I accept such a favor with a trusting heart. So that's justification, that's our reality. And the way that fleshes itself out in our lives is that we become more and more like Christ and able to obey him from a heart of gratitude. And one day that's consummated. Man, that's Good news. We should call it that. Gospel. All right. That's the helmet of salvation. Now the sword of the Spirit. Another offensive piece of equipment. It's an offensive and a defensive weapon. Some of you may not have known that about swords. But it's true. Josh was in seminary and he knew somebody one time who practiced sword fighting. You should ask him about it. Hebrews 4, 12 says this, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that is defensive. It's just going to make us more like Christ. It cuts us so that we become whole. 
But it's also offensive. We see Jesus use it like this when he's defending against Satan's attacks and he's going on the offensive. Satan twists scripture. Jesus responds with what? Scripture. This is the sword of the spirit. This is what the spirit uses. It's the word of God that is active and living. Right? So I listed these here because sometimes you'll hear this analogy. What should you do with the Bible? Five things. You can use them with your five fingers. Read, study, memorize, meditate, and apply. So as we think about our intake of Bible, my hope is that we don't just sort of sit down in the morning or in the evening or whenever you read your Bible and just sort of like plow through a couple of chapters and go, check that box, right? But as we read, maybe we have questions. We go deeper. What is the witch of Endor and why is Saul talking to her? So we study, we memorize, we take it in to our hearts, and then we think about it, we meditate on it, and we apply it. Those are five things we do with the sword of the Spirit. The analogy is that you take those five fingers and you wrap them around the sword and you fight with it. That's, that's the analogy. All right, prayer, finally. Prayer. Prayer is the heart of spiritual warfare. We see this in Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. After Paul finishes talking about the armor of God, These are the next verses. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. If you read the New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, The thing you find Christians doing all of the time is pray. You think about all the big events in the book of Acts, like the apostles are drugged before the Sanhedrin. They're threatened. What do they do? Man, we're going to serve God, and we're going to go back preaching. No, that's not what they do. They leave, and they go, and they pray. All the believers are gathered together. They're terrified. They're facing persecution. They pray. The Lord makes them bold. My favorite is... Like when Peter is in prison, right? It says that all of the disciples, all the followers of Jesus are like gathered at this house and they're praying. They're praying that the Lord would release Peter. And the Lord does. Peter is so comfortable in prison, resting in who Jesus is, that like he's got to be prodded nine different ways and told to put on his clothes and led like a little kid out of the opening gates of the prison. He's actually led to this house and then he like really wakes up, which is fascinating to me. And they're praying. They're praying all this time. Peter knocks on the door and the servant goes and opens it. And she's so shocked to see Peter. She runs back to the people who are continuing to pray. She says, guys, prayers have been answered. Peter's at the door. They're like, no, he's in prison. That's why we're praying, right? They're constantly devoting themselves to prayer. It's effective even when we feel like it may not be. It's wonderful. Think about all the reasons they prayed. They prayed when they were facing persecution. They prayed because they were dependent on God's power. They were dependent on God's power, and they knew that. God didn't just sort of clean them up to make them effective, and then they did the rest. No, they're dependent on His power. They're desperate for His grace. They're devoted to God's mission. Again, that's David Platt there. I tend not to alliterate, but he was pretty good at it. He also wrote it in threes, which I appreciate because I'm a Baptist. And all of these things we see fleshed out in their prayers. If you read the prayers of Christians, you will see those things. They prayed when they were gathered together, and they prayed when they were scattered apart. Right? It's not just private prayer we see in the New Testament. Like when we, in just a few moments, like confess our sins together, when Bo leads us in this time of corporate prayer this morning, like we're not just sort of like counting down the minutes to make sure we fill the whole time. Like we're actually waging warfare in our hearts, for our people, for the nations. They prayed for the success of God's word. We see this, like, Lord, your word has gone out. We're carrying your word with us. Make it effective. They prayed for their needs. It is not selfish to pray for your needs. Some of us may have been taught that it was. We we are a needy people. We see Christians pray for their needs, provision. We see them pray for the world. They pray for the lost world. They pray for the spread of God's worship. John Piper has famously said that the chief end of missions is worship. Missions exists because worship does not exist in places in our world. This is really what we're after. We're told us what the Father is seeking. He's seeking worshipers. And so they pray for the spread of the worship of God because here's the thing. Worship exists everywhere. Worship of God does not exist everywhere. All right? That's true in our hearts as well. We are always worshiping something, right? So we should pray for the spread of 
worship of God in our own hearts. So this is, hope, hopefully, here, here's my goal, is that uh, maybe this time uh, has corrected some of the, the main points of spiritual warfare in your mind, shifted our focus a little bit away. I'm not, I'm not saying that Satan is unimportant, right? We're told he's a roaring lion. Um, Peter is told, like, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And then he's told that Jesus prays for him so his faith wouldn't fail. And I love that. But, but hopefully, we now have an understanding of the main sort of contours of this warfare language, why it's used, for what purposes. I do want to spend just a moment before we go. We don't have like a closing activity or discussion, but I want to draw your attention to a couple of these recommended resources just to tell you about them. You want to go ahead and write down uh, C.S. Lewis, the screw tape letters. Um, but because there are some older works, and I have some poor capitalization in here, uh, I want to, want to explain a little bit. Uh, the resource at the bottom, Secret Church, Spiritual Warfare, David Platt, you can find it at Radical.net. They make all of their secret churches free along with their handouts. They even have the blanks filled in. And this one is tremendous. I mean, they're all great, but this one is especially helpful. I pulled a lot of this from there, uh, especially if you've got questions about demons and oppression and generational curses and things like that. Uh, you can watch the video of it and go through the handout. Uh, so I'd recommend that. Two kind of cousin works, or at least they were presented like cousin works to me. Uh, On the Mortification of Sin and Believers by John Owen. John Owen was a Puritan. You can find some modernized uh, English versions of this. He wrote in English. His English was just a little bit more different than ours is. Um, It is the single best work on how to kill sin uh, that exists. And hopefully, I mean, Spencer and Josh, would you agree with that? They said it, so it's true. Um, But it is phenomenal. If you want to think about how sin works in your life and how you can see it eradicated... There is no better resource. But cousin to that is Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And what I love that that Thomas Brooks does in this book is he walks through the different strategies that we see Satan use in our lives with temptation. Uh, So again, if you think about our flesh being the hook, the world being the bait, and Satan's always baiting the hook. If you want to know how that works, this is a great book. I guarantee you, if you read it, you will look over your shoulder as if he is writing it, looking at you. It is, it is that accurate and that helpful. And the thing that I love sometimes, I don't know, maybe you're not as sinful as I am, but I don't gravitate toward reading these books because I don't like what I see inside of me, right? I, I like not seeing a whole lot of sin and temptation in the flesh. And these books do reveal that. But you'll notice the title is not Satan's Devices. It's Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And there is good news that is packed in there for your heart. So I would highly recommend it. Uh, There's a helpful little summary I sent to somebody earlier this week. Uh, If you would like that summary, I can send it to you. Let me know. Uh, It's just sort of an outline form of the book. Um, And then uh, C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. If you want to see that kind of fleshed out, if you've never read the Screw Tape Letters, basically it's a set of fictional letters from a senior demon uh, to a uh, junior demon. And it's, it's basically explaining to him how to bait the hook. And you'll see a lot of Thomas Brooks in there, uh, just the strategies that are used. But it, it tells propositional truth in a narrative form, which is the best that Christian fiction has to offer. So I'd highly recommend it to you. Someone stole my copy. I need to buy a new one. So if you'll let me know, maybe I can order you one and order me one at the same time. Um, I was at my last church. But I hope, hey, you who borrowed that book, I hope it's useful in your life if you're watching. Finally, uh, How People Change by Paul Tripp and Timothy Lane. Uh, both counselors, uh, just a really practical guide to how this happens in, in your life, how we can actually see change. Um, one of the, the best lines I ever heard a Christian counselor utter is he said, when somebody comes to meet with me, I tell them, hey, Christmas at your house this year can be different. Like it really can. You're not going to meet with me forever. This is a limited time thing because the Lord actually works and changes his people. And so if you want to know how that happens, uh, that's a great book. Also, I didn't put this on there, but Side by Side uh, is another book written by Ed Welch, uh, who uh, is a counselor as well. Highly recommend that. I know we don't usually spend time going over these, but this is, I think, an experiential issue in our lives. Like this isn't just theological stuff out there. This is our day-to-day lives, and these books have been tremendously helpful to me. I hope they will be to you. Now, let me close our time together with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, be dismissed for the next 43 minutes. Father, we thank you for what we see in your word. Lord, we confess to you that we are sinful. Our flesh is prone and inclined to evil. But Lord, we thank you that you have made us right before you. 
you have justified us. You have not left us alone in our sanctification as if we have to produce it on our own. You have promised us that your spirit is at work in us, and one day you will bring that work to completion. So we pray that as hopefully our minds have been enlightened uh, to the resources that we have in Jesus, uh, that you would make us effective in waging war against our sin. And Lord, that you would make us instruments of your grace and your word as it goes out to the world. Whether we would rightly see ourselves in our, our world, we would rightly trust you and wage war. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.